Okay, let us begin with our metta recital. Okay. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, may all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, no despise anyone anywhere. Neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless living friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment, whether standing, walking, or lie, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake. One should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision. Removing desire for sensual pleasures, one comes never again to birth in the womb. Okay, friends, with this metta thought, let us begin our meditation. As I repeat, yes, repeated yesterday, we are going to recite the same. We are going to give the same instructions. <coughs> this is a sort of a standard instructions that we have to keep in mind. We pay total, mindful, undivided attention to our breathing and stay with the breath without using words or concepts. As we pay attention to the breath, we notice the breath through our feelings, and that feeling also changes as the breath rises and falls. Our perception changes as the breath and the feeling changes. Our attention or intention change as the breath, feeling, perception change. Consciousness changes as we breathe and notice the changes of perception, thought, and breath and the feelings. As they change constantly, there is nothing to excite. Everything without any exception is changing, changing, changing. And at that time, there is no room for greed desire, lust, craving to arise, they all subside. Mind becomes even calmer, more peaceful. The breath is calm and peaceful. Feelings become calm and peaceful. In that state, our Rigidity, uptightness, resentment also fades away. 
the mind remains full of the feeling of metta. Metta feeling pervades our entire minds. And then we become even more calm and peaceful. That is the state sometimes some people feel sleepy and immediately we become aware of the sleepiness and stay awake, open our eyes, roll our eyeballs and try to keep awake. awake. If it doesn't work, take a deep breath, hold it as long as you can and then slowly breathe out. If you repeat this several times, then the body warms up. You even feel perspiring. That time sleepiness disappears. Then it will be a very wonderful moment. Then restlessness and worry can arise because of too much energy. So we have to overcome restlessness and worry by being more realistic. Restlessness and worry arise because of our unrealistic way of thinking (coughs) of the past or of the future. We say it is unrealistic because we all know the past is already gone. Not a trace of past is there except our memory. The future has not come yet except our pondering and imagining. And therefore when the mind does not go to the past or to the future, we can focus it in the, on the present moment. Present moment is not also empty moment. Present moment is full of awareness of breath, feelings, perceptions, attention, consciousness, present moments is filled with these aggregates. So they all rise and fall just as they did in the past. When we see this, the mind and body become even more calm, relaxed and more peaceful. So we gain more and more calm and relaxed states of mind. At that time, we still may have some doubt about our own success or the method the Buddha introduced. (coughs) But we have to have full confidence in the Buddha because he expressed this or taught this teaching this Dhamma, from his own personal experience. And he attained full enlightenment. With this experience of enlightenment, experience of his practice, he was fully convinced this is the method. We know that he repeated this even in the first sermon, he mastered the, this master this truth by knowing as theory, putting the theory into practice, and finding the results. He he made a very powerful scientific approach to realize the truth 
and there is no doubt in his mind. So he went from place to place, met many different type of people, and delivered the message of truth. And it is still valid up to this moment. And therefore, we must have full confidence in the Buddha. Buddha followed the Dhamma, which was his own teacher. By following that Dhamma, he attained full enlightenment. And then his immediate disciples and other disciples who followed them over many thousands of years, and they all attained the same state of enlightenment. Now we have more than one reason to build up our confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Moreover, we ourselves have experienced a success by overcoming our four of our hindrances. Now this is the last hindrance, doubt, so that also we can overcome using our experience and the Buddha's and the trust in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, we can overcome doubt. When we overcome doubt, we feel as if we are completely free. We overcome greed, which is like being indebted, and when we pay all our debts, we feel very secure and glad. Anger or hatred is compared to sickness. We overcome, it is just like when it when we overcome our anger, we feel as if we recover from sickness. Sleepiness and drowsiness is like being in a prison where there are a lot of restrictions and you cannot go out. You are confined to four walls and the roof and the floor. When come out of jail, you feel so safe and independent, free to go anywhere you like. You feel that way when you overcome sleepiness and drowsiness. <clears throat> when you overcome restlessness and worry, you feel as if you are free from slavery. When you overcome your doubt, you feel as if you came out of a desert where you stranded without knowing where to go, but eventually came out. These are five similes to illustrate the feeling that we have when we overcome these hindrances. And then joy arises. This joy it makes us even more calm and peaceful. This increases by degrees. Joy increases. And then it leads up to happiness, which makes us even more calm, relaxed, and peaceful. At that time, we have very, very clear vision in mind. With this clear vision, with concentrated state of mind, free from hindrances, we can focus that mind on the five aggregate once again. And we see everything is incessantly changing all the time. 
that feeling, that experience, that awareness is also very vital, important. So, with this understanding, this insight and concentration, we focus the mind on the five aggregates. We see each aggregate is in a state of flux, changing, the breath is changing, feeling is changing, perception is changing, attention is changing, consciousness is changing. All these represent the five aggregates. They are in a state of flux. They all are changing. When we see these changes, our greed fades away, hatred fades away, confusion fades away. And therefore, let us continue this practice and see for ourselves the benefit. So I stop right here for you to go through the instructions and see for yourself how wonderful it is, how beneficial it is. Now, I, as I mentioned yesterday, I like all of you to keep all the instructions in mind and then ask me questions with regard to the practice. Okay. All right, let us begin our practice.
by means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the foolish, may I always join with the wise, until the time I attain Ibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, may the grieving be free from grief, so too may all beings be. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, may all beings arisen in these realms, with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, friends, you can ask your questions. My friend Brian will read them for me. Okay, Brian. Are there questions in the chat box? Okay, Bhantiji, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So the first question, dear Bhante, it has become quite clear to me that there is something which is knowing the impermanent objective experiencing at the six sense bases. What is this knowing which knows the arising, changing, and vanishing of objective phenomenal experience, but does not itself change along with them. Yes, that's a good question. It is very interesting. The noticing mind, noticing impermanence, the mind notices impermanent while changing itself. Mind is noticing impermanence, and while mind itself being impermanent. And I mentioned sometimes ago, don't ask where the mind is. The fact that you notice changes in itself is enough without knowing where the mind is. It doesn't matter where the mind is. The mind knows it changes and objects changing. And therefore, we are immersed in the experience of changes, impermanence. That's a very powerful experience to overcome greed, hatred, and delusion, the causes of suffering. We want to be liberated from suffering. In order to be liberated from suffering, experiencing, realizing, comprehending fully well, Impermanence is important. So that is what we have to keep in mind. And that is not something we learn from books, from teachers, from any source outside. We learn it within ourselves. Okay. Next question. Thank you, Bhante. Next question. In present times, with options for so many interventions to prolong a person's life, what are the repercussions of choosing palliative care from a dhamma karmic aspect? And then the person says, for instance, hospice uses morphine at the end of life. Is this acceptable according to Buddhist thought? Half seeing impermanent? Uh, Could you repeat the question? Yes, Bhante. 
in present times with options for so many interventions to prolong a person's life, what are the repercussions of choosing palliative care? Uh, choosing, cho choosing what? Palliative care. Um, for instance, refusing interventions. Uh -huh. um, and then they say hospice uses morphine at the end of life. Is this acceptable according to Buddhist thought? Uh, now, using uh, morphine I is just uh, trying to uh, hiding the truth. Sometimes uh, surely some pains, some kind of pain is uh, so excruciating and we cannot tolerate it. But from the Dhamma point of view, even such a pain should be used to understand the nature of suffering. This doesn't mean that we torture ourselves deliberately, but we train the mind to accept the reality and sometimes that moment one can even attain full enlightenment, full enlightenment. And Buddha himself has mentioned it, that sometimes when you keep practicing, practicing, practicing impermanence, we may attain, the, attain liberation at the early stage of our life, or in the middle stage of life, or the last moment of our life. One of these three stages, three situations, one of these three periods, we can attain liberation. It doesn't happen automatically, but it happens through the training of our mind. We have to train the mind to accept the reality. And therefore using morphine may temporarily or at that moment can hide or we can um, calm ourselves uh, at the moment and pass away. But again we have to start all over again in the next life. Uh, and of course, this, that is, this is the most uh, prevalent, accept, accepted uh, practice in, uh, you know, health care system, in hospitals, hospice, and so on. Uh, I know some individuals, there are very few such individuals in the world today, I mean there may be many, I don't know, I know at least a couple of them, who had uh, cancer and uh, were, were in very, very painful state. And uh, I have not witnessed myself them passing away. And people who were around them at the moment of passing away, told me that they refused to take any painkillers, morphine, but they wanted to experience the very uh, agonizing pain, using that as a part of their meditation. They have been meditators all their life and therefore even the last moment they want to be in meditation when they 
pass away. That is what I have to say. Uh, in uh, uh, noble principles of the practice, we can come even up to that level where we will be on the verge of attaining liberation. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Bhante. Um, Bhante, the, the next question uh, seems to relate to the first question. Um, the person writes, thank you for considering this question, Bhante. As I have practiced, I noticed an underlying reality beneath the feeling, perception, attention, and the awareness of the breath. This underlying reality seems completely stable and unchanging. I often switch my object of meditation to this unchanging reality, which I consider, quote unquote, fundamental consciousness. This reality feels very expansive, as though it is universal. Could you please comment on this? Actually, universal reality, that does not change, is Nibbana. All other realities are subject to change. If you experience that, then that is wonderful, that you experience total liberation where nothing can you see existing for you to see touch, smell, taste, and think. But you experience just pure peace. That is inexpressible peace. No word to express it. You don't lose that peace. You may have peaceful moments which change, disappear sometimes and you have to rebuild that. But this peace prevails, this peace is, I must say, eternal, never changing peace. That is called bliss of Nibbana, peace of Nibbana. And if you have that, congratulations. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, I, you know, Bhante, the next question, I think you just answered it, but let me ask, um, and we can just be sure of that. Dear Bhante, you said yesterday that Dhamma is not changing. If it is unconditioned, does it mean that Dhamma is Nibbana? Yeah. Unconditioned Dhamma is Nibbana. Unconditioned Dhamma is Nibbana. You know the word Dhamma we use for any mental object. Any mental object is Dhamma, therefore even that is subject to change. But Nibbana is not that kind of Dhamma, that is uh, supramundane Dhamma. Supramundane Dhamma is uh, beyond any mundane object. Uh, this, is, this is not an object for subject to, uh, be, to, to, to uh, subjugate. It is there when all the greed, hatred, delusion and all these are removed, this will appear. 
you don't have to create it. You have to remove all the defilements for it to appear. And that is Nibbana. Thank you, Bhante. Um, keeping with the theme of removing the defilements, uh, one person wanted to know if um, if metta practice is a a good weapon for um, battling these uh, defilements of mental defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion, and if um, Buddhist practitioners should be taught to use metta for that purpose. Metta itself is subject to change, although it is so wonderful, blissful, peaceful experience, and still it is subject to change. Uh, that is wonderful practice, uh, particularly to overcome hatred and greed. But ignorance is still is there. Therefore, uh, metta has its own limitations, and with this limitation we practice metta, so that we experience great uh, moments of peace without greed and hatred. And since it is subject to change, uh, that can be used as an object of meditation. Uh, Buddha himself has mentioned, even though metta is a wonderful practice, and still it is subject to change. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Bhante. Okay, welcome. Um, the next question is, yeah. Venerable, Venerable Bhante, um, uh, what qualities are important in order for a person to be a good and long-lasting monk? What would you suggest to one who wants to engage in a higher training? Yeah. I think that's two questions, Monte. Maybe the first one is, what qualities are, are important for a person to be a good and long-lasting monk? Yeah, that is also a very good question. The one who respects precepts, one who is trained by rules and regulation, that's called uh, Sikha Pada Vinaya. Sikha Pada Vinaya. At the same time, he must be trained with Dhamma Vinaya. Sikha Pada Vinaya is making the monk outwardly very polite, outwardly kind, outwardly following manners and etiquettes, speaking softly and gently and so on, doesn't do any, doesn't break any rules. At the same time, his mind must be pure, clean by following the Dhamma Vinaya. Dhamma Vinaya means Vinaya or disciplining by the understanding of Dhamma. This is self-mastery. One does not need any external reward or punishment. One always looks inside to see the mind and see how clean the mind is, how pure the mind is. And therefore, when a monk is trained in these two ways, 
that monk is a good monk. If a monk like any of this may not be 100% good monk. Okay, this is the summary. That means one has to be trained by rules and regulations as well as understanding the Dhamma and following the Dhamma and discipline oneself internally by oneself, whether with people or without people, inside or outside, closed door or open door, the mind remains very, very pure and clean. That's a good monk. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bhante. The second question the person had is, um, what would you suggest to one who wants to engage in a higher training? Yeah, one has to, uh, as I said, follow the, uh, especially for a monk, follow the Patimokka rule. Or none follow the Patimokka rules. For nuns, there are 311, monks, 227, they follow this. this. By following these rules, that person's outward becomes polished. It is just like rolling a rock in a river for a long period of time the rock becomes smooth outside, but inside it remains a rock, very hard. But if you take that rock and put in the very strong fire, even that rock can become can be melted. Similarly, outward politeness, gentleness, softness is one thing and having inner purity and clarity is another. So, to be a good person, whether monk or nun or layman or laywoman, the person has to be trained in these two ways. Buddha, all the Buddhas have given one advice, that is sabba papa sa akarana, kusala sa upasampada, sajitta pariyodapana, etang buddhana sahasana. Not doing any evil, sabba papa sa, all evil, papa means evil, not doing any evil, but not doing any evil is not enough. Kusala sa upasampada, promoting skill or wisdom, promoting wisdom, sachitta pariyodapana, purifying one's own mind. This covers the entire teachings of the Buddha. If one follows these instructions of all the Buddhas, that person is following the Dhamma rules and become very wonderful, peaceful, enlightened person. Okay? Any other question? Yeah, Bhante, um, there are only two questions left, and, and they, um, they're on the same topic, and they're both in response to your Dhamma talk yesterday. Uh -huh. um, and both people, just to summarize, both people are concerned that um, 
that yes, the world is filled with injustice and dukkha, and that it's sort of it would be irrespons- irresponsible of us not to take wise action um, and and just to just to um, respond to to these injustices and this dukkha with um, with only metta. And they, they want you to comment on that. Right. As I mentioned, world's injustices you cannot eliminate. This is a very practical uh, advice. World injustices will always be there. Realizing you, if you try to eliminate all the world injustices, you will break your neck. You can never do that. Humanly impossible. The world is made up, the world has almost going to be 8 billion people. These people are always in action, doing something or other, all the time. All of them are not enlightened persons. They have their own limitations, they are all shortcomings, and therefore they are bound to make injustices, do things which we will not approve. That is very true, realistic, and therefore Do what you can. Say, for instance, there is injustice in your family. Try to settle it with a mindfulness, with metta, with uh, compassion, uh, with rewards, with punishments, and so forth. You can at least try to settle the problems in the house. That much you can do. Suppose you make one person very just and honest and peaceful in your family, that person can influence other people and they, some of them can influence other people and can make some progress, achievements. But if you think of correcting everyone everywhere all over the world, that is not going to happen. And therefore, uh, while doing what you can do in your family, in your immediate uh, vicinity, immediate environment, practice metta for the rest. So you can do both. Okay? Then you will be very practical person Uh, I talk from my own personal experience. I know injustice is intolerable, but at the same time I must be realistic and I have to do what I can and for the rest I have practice patience, compassion, wisdom, understanding, metta, and all this. Okay? Thank you, Bhante. I think that's all time we have this morning. I think what I am telling everybody is something practical. Okay, friends. Uh, Thank you for your participation and asking these very intelligent, very good questions. And I want to end this session by wishing all those who are suffering in the hospital, may they all recover very quickly, return to their normal health, continue their Dhamma practice, to overcome samsaric suffering, not only in one life suffering, but total suffering in samsaric existence. 
and all those doctors, nurses, hospital staffs who dedicate very compassionately, risking their own lives, sacrifice their comfort, dedicating their effort and in, in, in their wisdom, understanding, training and all this to help people. May they continue their wonderful service and live long in very good health, in peace and attain liberation. And those people who have lost their loved ones, uh, they were grieving and I hope by now those who have lost their relatives some years ago may be recovered and those who are new people grieving over the death of their loved ones recover very soon and return to their normal life, practice Dhamma. This all can be used as very important uh, moment for us to reflect on Dhamma and to liberate, our, liberate ourselves from suffering. And all others who are generously supporting all these wonderful projects all over the world, may they continue their compassionate, generous practice for the benefit of all other beings and live long in very good health and attain total liberation from samsara. And those leaders who have taken and given very wonderful leadership to help the world, may they continue their compassionate, insightful leadership and live long in very good health. Overall, all of you who support this project of uh, listening of these Dhamma talks, your participation encourages me, add more energy to me, and thereby more and more people benefit. Me benefit, you benefit, everybody benefits, and we all try to continue our uh, participation, and we all try to liberate ourselves from samsaric suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.